And we're back with Masters of the Air, episode three. What an episode. What an episode. We lost, I mean, caps off. And I don't know how to talk about it on a podcast recapping television. These are real people. And there's some terms I realized I don't actually know where these all come from. Pour one out, as in you just pour one on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pour one out, what about, but also raise a glass. Raise a glass. What about a hair of the dog that bit you? Wow. Is that one? That one might be from episode four or five, actually. That might be a later episode. The hair of the dog, yeah. All I know is we lost our boy in this episode. Barry. Barry is gone, but not forgotten. This was a really intense one because it was just so much death and destruction where I thought the first two episodes already had covered that, and then this went so much deeper. Yeah, no, I think... So, you know, high level, this is the episode where they're basically flying a bombing run, and then they have to fly all the way down to uh, northern Africa to land. So they're in the air for a long-ass time, and that is just an insane amount of vulnerability being in the, being in the sky. And, you know, it really just goes to show how how vulnerable these guys are up in there in their planes and that their bombing runs are kind of insane. Yeah. There's something, honestly, it was interesting at first. Now it's almost dark to see them open those curtains. Like you're at a cinema and just have a giant map with the route of death and just being like, you're going straight into Germany. Good luck. And then to watch that <laughs> route go all the way down to Africa and bury you know, hey, hey that, why is that line go down to Africa? Very astute observation, Lieutenant. <laughs> leave that question for later. Just to be able to look at that picture and know, oh, most of us are not going to make it. Must have been pretty terrifying. Yeah. The, the kind of the map sequences in these episodes are good kind of structuring for each episode. So, the real, so that we, we, we as an audience understand ahead of time, okay, you know, this is the, the flight path that they're taking, which means we as an audience understand like this is going to be, you know, the this is where the episode's going to end, hopefully, is when they're there in Africa. So, like, I kind of like that as a narrative structure, but it certainly does kind of demonstrate that these are just kids creating flight paths for other kids. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that, like, you know, most, most, a lot of people are going to die on. Yeah. The part for me, too, is by 1942, 43, the number of people who had flown on airplanes was minuscule. I mean, this is the, these kids' first times being in a plane, and then you're being assigned by the Air Force. Figure out wind, resistance, fuel, the weight of your plane, how that will change with drag before and after you drop your payload. It's insane to think about it now, where it's like looking at a paper map, Flying into enemy territory, flat cannons going off, and they're still like, yeah, navigate us to the target, and then all the way to Africa. I had watched a couple mini B-17 documentaries after this episode, because I just needed a little more context about, like, how strong were these planes? What was actually happening? How many made it? The average crew during World War II for the U.S. flew five to seven missions before being shot down over Europe. Oh my gosh. That's, that's pretty terrible odds. So five to seven missions. The most famous B-17 of all time, the Memphis Bell, which had a documentary done in the 1940s, and then a really good movie in the 90s about it. It flew 25 missions. And that was so remarkable that it survived that long. They shipped it back to the U.S. and just did a massive war bonds tour. They're like, see, one of them can survive. Your boys might make it out alive. <laughs> oh my gosh. Just terrifying especially as we get further in the season not yet but further in the season when they're flying back-to-back -back missions mm. that's five days that's two weeks good luck oh. yeah like you're rolling the dice every time you get in the air and not just because of like flak and because of enemy pilots like you're rolling the dice on your own equipment yeah like there, you know, there were there were plenty of scenes where you know they're just getting trying to get into formation, and their engines go out, and they're like, "Oh, someone's lagging behind," you know, "Oh, it's pulling this way," and "Oh, we lost engine two or whatever," and it's just like, you know, they're not even getting shot at, and they're already in peril because their own machinery is struggling. 
Yeah, which speaks all the more to the bravery and honest, courageous ignorance of some of these people. I mean, Buck, yes. played by Austin Butler at one point, they are in the middle of flak. <laughs> engine one is on fire. Engine two is leaking. The whole entire plane is just shifting left to right. And his co-pilot goes, we got to bail out. There's just no way we can do a mission in this way. And Buck goes, we are going to sit here and take it. And I have never thought about being in the middle of a situation and just being like, our machinery is malfunctioning. We're just going to sit here and take it and continue the mission and hope we get to Africa. If my car makes a noise, I'm like, pull over. It's time for our rental. Like, we got to get right to a station. Not, not to mention a giant tin can with no pressurizing, uh, just flying through flak. I thought that was a really good scene, you know, because you could kind of tell that in Buck's crew that there, I think he had already, they'd already lost someone on his crew from flak. And you could tell that the rest of his crew was really like jittery and that they just wanted to take their chances with parachuting down into Germany. But, you know, to have a Buck just like, manhandle him and say we're just gonna sit here and we're gonna take it and it's either we're gonna land in africa or we're gonna blow up in the sky like that's yep. really it was a, it was a powerful scene and i think what i really, really like so far is that there's no the heroism is pretty general across the board like like that scene isn't it's not portrayed in such a way that people who bailed out of their planes chose the lesser option you know what i mean yeah, like like it's not that Buck's heroism and you know courage overpowers everyone else's. It's just that that was what they were doing in this plane. Yeah, and especially to walk watch everybody jump out. I I will say the filmmakers do a good job of not just letting it be off screen and nobody you know. It's like nope, we're gonna watch every time as this pilot flips the switch. People are trying to get out of things. And they're just trying to jump out the chute and and make it down. And then and getting their like gear caught on things, or like they're trying, they they get stuck inside of things. Like getting out of the plane is part of the peril. Like it's not just an easy thing. And I do like they show a little bit of the other pilots recognizing like our death trap is still in front of us. Theirs is right below them. They're parachuting into enemy territory. That's no better fate, like you just said. Like there's just. Mm-hmm not a safe way out once you're in the middle of that yeah i will say at least for me the explosions the parachutes all the debris coming down the the poor airman who hits their wing and then streaks off in a streak of blood it was intense and it didn't seem to be tarantino-esque of just like gratuitous like ah here you go here's more blood it was this sounds like it comes from someone's journal of like staring to the right and seeing your bunk mate or your you know your buddy from the base just sliding off your wing it's horrifying yeah well there's some there i think there's there's a dreamlike quality to some of these scenes especially there's this scene in particular in, in episode three and there's another one in, in a later episode where everything is just falling out of the sky and there's kind of this like serene dreamlike quality to the scene that I think you're right where it's not, it's not like gratuitous in a Tarantino kind of way. It's just like, this is what was happening and it's, it's literally insane. And they're but like the shrapnel is just falling, you know, the, the bits of plane are just falling out of the sky and the contrails. I think they did a really good job with the contrails behind the planes. Yeah just kind of like painting the sky and it's just very dreamlike, which I'm sure it is because, you know, having being in those experiences, I'm sure it's not a very, I'm sure it's not a very grounded experience. You know, I will tell a story of my grandma who lived in Norway during World War II. She talked about, she was like very young, you know, teenager, whatever else as, as the, the Germans and the U S and, and the Brits were all getting in dog fights, bombing runs, she said she would wait up at night, and if she heard the gunfire, would run to the window and watch, because it was the prettiest thing she had ever seen. Just wow. lights, lights in the air, and then explosions, fireballs, things hitting the water. It was the most beautiful firework show she had ever seen. She still talked about it. She's like, there was something beautiful just watching this show in the sky, and that I felt like, that's what you were saying felt like that was displayed in this episode of like, there's something odd about it because it is dreamlike, but also terrifying at the same time. Yes, absolutely. 
And to really punch in the stakes of the story, you know, we lose, we lose Barry Kilgan's character. And, you know, I know at the beginning when you're, when you're watching this, you're wondering like, oh, I wonder how many of these characters have plot armor where like, you know, our favorite characters are going to make it to the end because they're our favorite characters. And that is not the case. We, we are definitely, you know, going to lose people through over the course of the series. And Barry's, I can't remember what his character's name is, but Barry Kilgan's death in the show is, it's pretty visceral. Yeah, Lieutenant Biddick, Curtis Biddick. It's pretty visceral, and especially, like you're saying, you feel like there's plot armor. He's already had to crash land a plane. He's going to be fine. He just did it in, in Scotland, and it doesn't work out this time. And the plane erupts into a fireball. Wait, side tangent. Have you been working on the accents? Can you do anyone's voice? No, I cannot do anyone's voice. I want to be, I want to be able to do Austin Butler's Elvis voice, but I'm not going to try. <laughs> See, and, and, and Bucky, to me, there's just some kind of an old sensibility. <laughs> it's that Shane Gillis joke of like, the last time white people were cool was right before Jackie Robinson stepped up to the plate. When everyone was talking, ah, like, oh, yeah, what do you want there? Oh, yeah, 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 I got a piece of that. And then he steps up to the plate, knocks a home run out, and everyone's like, all right, we're not cool anymore. And that's kind of yeah. what it feels like. <laughs> Actually, you're totally right. Like, Bucky's character, not Austin Butler, Colin, the other kid, his, like, he seems so cool. And I, I think you're right. It's the cadence. It's, it's the accent. It's that old kind of transatlantic way of talking. And I'm like, I know I'm from Utah, and... Utah's English is probably the, the, the most vanilla English on planet Earth, but maybe if I could learn how to talk cooler, maybe I could go on more dates. Yeah, or you'd just be made fun of. It would be like the Tim Robinson crooner of like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not believable. Yeah, yeah no, uh, no, yeah, yeah, okay. Callum Turner really, he really figured it out because I'm just sitting there and I'm like, oh, I mean... He could take the pants off anybody. He could take anybody's money or beer. And he's probably going to win something gambling. He, yeah. It just sounds so cool. And so even in the emotional moments, I'm like, wow, it just sounds better. <laughs> it, it doesn't just sound so better. long. Yeah. I mean, when they watch that plane go down over the water, once they start crossing from Western Europe over the Mediterranean, and you hear Buck just being like, what is that? You know, 350 miles offshore. And he's like, yep. What? <laughs> like, how can you sound so cool, calm, collected? Goodbye. That's it. Yeah. I mean, they, they make a really good point in the scripting to be like, mark, mark what happened. Like, you know, part of the navigator's job is to like keep a record of what was happening in the sky. And so they're constantly like, you know, mark, mark that this happened and when it happened. And it's like, okay, this plane lands, may, it makes a water landing, and presumably everyone on board is, is alive. But they're 350 miles from land, and yeah. no one's coming to get them. They're not going to, like, they're toast. And so it, it kind of, it really does a good job of, of, of showing that really the only way out is to land your plane in Africa. That's it. That's the only way out. Every other, every other, every other option basically leads to death with some caveat. Yeah, and there's something that, is so beautiful and sad that they set up in the first two episodes. You got to buzz the tower because that's cool. Everyone's got to have a one wheel or a no wheels landing. And then the third thing, you got to have a gliding landing, just quiet over the runway. Bucky talks about it. He's yeah. telling everybody, he's like, oh my God, you just got to have this. It honestly startled me from a story perspective to see Buck land the plane gliding in the third episode. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> you hit the trifecta. All, all the cool moments are gone. There's no more like, oh, we got to wait till a later episode. No, that's it. And so Bucky there's no more says, glory left to be had. No. So Bucky turns to Buck and he's like, hey, we're all going to get through this. Come on. Don't you stop believing that. And Buck just with solemnity that just really bites with that accent. He's got his Elvis. He just says, Sure, Bucky. And that's when you know, okay, the hope is definitely faded. The reality's here. Yeah, no, that's, I think, I think, you know, as we, we talked about in the first two episodes, they do a good job of showing these, these boys coming in with a lot of confidence and arrogance about their roles here. 
But then over the course of you know each episode, you can you just see it being stripped away from them because they they understand what they're up against and how flimsy and fragile all of their missions are. And yeah. you know, like you said, five to seven missions on average before being shot down. That's 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 terrible. I just like the PTSD of just having to wake up and be like, today's today could be the day. And then for, you know, Buck to just say, sure, Bucky is like, I get that. I get that energy to just be like, you know what? I don't know if I'm into this macho stuff anymore. (laughs) And even though it's early in the season and they know a big portion of their audience is going to be people who just love the idea of war and the the courage and the stories, it's definitely Mm -hmm. painted a pretty clear picture of like, We don't think this is great. We don't think this is what we should be doing. The boys should be flying these planes. It's rough. It's hell. So I did enjoy that. And it did leave one more nugget for us for episode four, in which Sergeant William Quinn, who gets out of one of the planes, doesn't get babyface out of there, out of the bubble turret. Yeah. He's the last one off the plane. That was horrifying to watch. Yes, it was. And as soon as Quinn jumps out, he makes it 20 feet down, the entire plane explodes. Terrifying. He hits the ground, and you're like, ah, okay, he's safe. And then meet some Belgians, and you're like, oh, thank heavens, it's not Germans, it's Belgians. And that resistance fighter tells him, if you surrender to the Germans, you're protected by the Geneva Conventions, you'll be fine. But if you try to escape, you're treated as a spy, and you are executed. What do you choose? I mean, what a decision point. Yeah. No, that was that was very good. Yeah. I mean, and that helps to build the tension for all of these, you know, the bombing runs is it's not just you're either going to blow up or land. It's you're going to blow up or land or parachute down behind enemy lines. And then that's its own game. It's a ground game of how do you how do you get back? Which without telling too much, we will see more of in episode four. Yeah. Well, Madison, let's keep watching. We got another episode coming on next week. And uh, buckle up. It doesn't get any easier. Perfect. No, it doesn't. (laughs) (laughs) But enjoy. Enjoy.